Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this afternoon, Jenny Magira, Chief Program Officer for Ed Team, Tech Team and author of Courageous Adventures. At Ed Tech Team, Jenny focuses on diversity and equity in education. Previously, she served as the Chief Innovation Officer in Des Plaines Public School District 62, the Digital Learning Coordinator for the Academy for Urban School Leadership, and a Chicago Public Schools teacher. She is also a White House Champion for Change, an Apple Distinguished Educator, a Google for Education Certified Innovator, and a TEDx Speaker. Jenny seeks to redefine teaching and learning through innovative practices and is passionate about transforming professional learning. She is a co-founder of Playdate and other new conference concepts. Aside from her students, Jenny's great loves in her life are sci-fi, mashed potatoes, Tabasco sauce, her dog, and her husband. Please join me in giving Jenny a warm welcome as she shares our untold stories. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you guys for joining me for lunch. Everyone um, uh, laughs when they hear that. That's a little bit of an older bio. And my mother-in-law actually asked me to change it because she heard me speak one time. And she was like, why is my son last in the list of things you love? Like Tabasco sauce and mashed potatoes are above your list of your husband. And I was like, I was doing it in reverse order of importance. But OK, sure. But I mean, come on, mashed potatoes, am I right? Yay, Thanksgiving. <laughs> So I'm really excited to be with you here today. Um, I went to school in New Hampshire. I went to high school here. And coming back to the Granite State is always really exciting. I was one of the kids who like, really understood why it was called the Granite State, because uh, there was a geology class in my high school. And the way that uh, the geology class was was they'd drive us to the side of one of the highways and give us a pickaxe and let us bang on it and be like, look, granite, see? Rocks, geology, nailed it. So that was like our real world uh, authentic learning in uh, the 90s. But today I want to talk to you about stories that come from across education, not just my own high school career, and um, what those stories do for us as educators. And to kick it off, I want to uh, tell you a little story that comes from um, a country on the other side of the world, Korea. And it actually comes from the capital of Korea in Seoul. It begins, begins with a little girl named Kyungshin. Kyungshin was born in Korea's capital, and uh, as she grew, she heard stories around the dinner table of the hopes and dreams of her parents. Kyungshin's father, Chang Yeol, really wanted to become a physician, a medical doctor. And in his mind, the best place to practice medicine in all of the world was the United States. You just heard Pernille Rip talk about immigration and privilege and what it's like to come to another country. And for Kyungshin's father, this seemed like an impossible dream to immigrate to the United States and to practice medicine there. So imagine how excited her family was when one day at dinner, her father announced that not only had he achieved his dream of becoming a medical professional, but that he was being asked to come to the United States and to practice medicine here. And not just anywhere in the United States, the part of the United States that many people from other countries see in movies, romanticize, New York City. So they packed up their bags, they came to the United States, and as they got there, they realized that they wanted their children to be able to have um, a really accepted life here in the United States. So Kyungshin's mother decided that she was going to give her a new American name. Now, for Kyungshin, this was also very exciting because at this point she was eight years old, and to be able to hear that you get to reinvent yourself as an eight-year-old is a pretty exciting prospect. Her family didn't know a lot of American names. Uh, American TV wasn't popular in Korea at the time, and so she went next door to the best resource she had, her gossipy neighbor. So she knocked, knocked, knocked on the door, and she said, I would like to give my children some classic American names. Can you help me name my daughter Kyungshin? The neighbor thought and thought, and she said, yes. I have the perfect name for your daughter. It is the most classic, timeless, beautiful American name any mother could ever hope to name her child. And so she suggested the name K. 
Carol. Beautiful. Any Carols in the house? No? Not one. All right. Well, too bad, because this name's great. Now, they went to City Hall, walked up to the desk, got the forms, and Kyungshin's mother said to the City Hall clerk, Hello, I would like for my daughter to be called Carol. And the City Hall clerk said, Sure, how do you spell that? And the mother was like, I don't know. So she just sounded it out. Now, I don't know how many of you are linguists or familiar with the Korean language, but phonetically, in Korean, there are not the same sounds that there are in the English language. For example, in Korean, an R is pronounced like an L or a D, like a L. And there, you can never end, fun fact, a Korean word with a consonant. It always ends in a vowel. So, when Kyungshin's mother walked up proudly to that city hall desk and said, I would like for my daughter to be named Carol, she pronounced it Kettle. And so, Kyungshin's name was therefore officially in the United States, K-E-L-L-O, because that's what the city hall clerk heard. Now, the child formerly known as Kyungshin, now known as Kello, went to third grade in, uh, in Flushing, in Queens, New York. And as the teacher was reading roll, she got to the name Kello. And the teacher, well-meaning, well-intentioned, said, oh, that's an interesting name. Where does it come from? And the young girl, Kello, said, well, it was kind of a mistake. And all of a sudden, all of the students in the room, who first of all were shocked to see someone who looked so different from them sitting in their midst, also found out that she had a made-up accidental name. And all of a sudden, that became Kello's single story for the entire school year. She was the foreign girl from a country that people hadn't heard much of with a mistake for a name. Kello, who had once been talkative, jokeful, silly, all of a sudden became very introverted because this is all that people knew of her. She became shy. She drew into herself. The former Kello Kyungshin that she had known her whole life all of a sudden became invisible under the roar of the stories that other kids were telling about her. This single story began to define her and she began to believe it about herself, but it wasn't until she got to fourth grade and had a teacher ask her a very specific question that it all changed. The teacher asked her, what do you want to be called this year? She thought to herself, no one has ever asked me that. Even when I got to come to the United States, when my mother allowed me to reinvent myself at City Hall with a new name, she didn't ask me what I wanted to be called. She asked her next-door neighbor. So she thought and she thought. And she remembered recently reading a book. And in the book, there was this little girl who was brave and smart and funny. And that's who she really thought of herself. That was the identity she most uh, found when she looked in the mirror. And she wanted to be known as that person. So she looked at her teacher and she said, can you call me Katie? And the teacher said, sure. And so for the rest of the year, she was known as Katie. She went home and she was Katie. In fact, when she turned 18 years old, she legally changed her name to Katie because this was how she saw herself. This was the story of herself that she believed to be true. And you know what about this little girl? She did grow up to be smart, and she did grow up to be brave, and she did grow up to be funny, and she also grew up to be my mom. Notice our really fashionable outfits. <laughs> I'm very happy to see that fanny packs are back in style. Now my mother would tell me the story over and over again, and she would say to me, Jennifer, which was funny. I go by Jenny, but my mother would always say, nicknames are for weak people, which is weird because she has this whole story about her name. But <laughs> um, Mom hypocrisy is allowed. Like, moms can just say whatever they want. She would say to me, Jennifer, you need, I would come home from school and I'd be like, my teacher doesn't understand me, meh, meh, quack, quack, quack. And my mother would say, Jennifer, you listen to your teacher. And you give them their respect because you know what about teachers? They can help you become your whole self. And my mother truly believed it. And she talked all the time about how if her teacher hadn't asked her that question in fourth grade, who would she be today? Because if you were to meet my mom, unfortunately, uh, she passed away a few years ago, but if you were to meet her, you would see the version of herself that she was always meant to be. She was gregarious, hilarious. She never shied away from telling people their opinion, her opinions. 
And she would have never gotten to be that person if the teacher hadn't asked her that question, who do you want to be? And she really helped me realize the power that a teacher can have on your life. Because until that moment, she was defined by that single story that her classmates chose to tell and retell and only tell about her. And when I recently saw the TED Talk by the Nigerian author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, did I know that this was called a single story. I'd heard this all growing up through my life, but I didn't really understand this concept until I watched this TED Talk. How many of you have seen this before? Okay, if you haven't seen it, feel free to just like go out in the back, watch it for 18 minutes, and come back in. It's going to be way more entertaining than what I'm going to say, but it is mind-blowing. Because what Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie says is that across societies, all societies, there are single stories told about all different types of people. Teachers, women, children, immigrants, any group of people from New Hampshire. I actually don't know what a single story about someone from New Hampshire is, but there probably are. Now, yeah, they rock. Granite State, get it? Rock joke. Thank you, three people, for laughing. I appreciate it. But the thing that Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie says is that these single stories lead to stereotypes. When a single story is told about a group of people, it then forms stereotypes. But here's the thing about stereotypes. She points out that stereotypes aren't necessarily wrong. They're just incomplete. So for example, there is a stereotype about Asian women and driving. And the stereotype, if you haven't heard it, is that they're not very good at driving. Now, that's not true about all Asian women. But this Asian woman is not a good driver. We just got a new car, and I crashed it like two days later. Everyone's fine. I crashed into a wall, but not a great driver. But that does not mean that all Asian women are bad drivers. How unfair would it be if that one story of me became the story for all Asian women? And unfortunately, it has. Now, the thing about single stories is there's a really great and simple way to combat single stories, and that's telling the untold stories. Be it untold stories of Korean gals who are great drivers, or untold stories of kids like my mother, who may seem shy in the classroom, but won't stop talking once they get home. These untold stories are really powerful and really important for us as educators to suss out because, unfortunately, our industry and our profession has some of the most untold stories of any industry I've ever seen in all the work I do. There are so many stereotypes, not only about our students, but about us as teachers as well. If I see another caricature about an educator on Saturday Night Live or a sitcom that I feel to be so single-sided, I might just lose my mind. There's so much more depth and complexity to us and to our students and to the organizations and industries that we work in, and they need to be told. So today, while we have some time over lunch, I'm going to give you five of the untold stories that mean a lot to me. The first is the single story of student self-image and the untold story of limitless potential. Now, the job that I had, as you heard, before coming to EdTech team was I was a district administrator. And one of the things I had the honor of doing as a district administrator was applying for district-wide grant monies to support the schools that I served. My first year, I was able to win a grant to bring coding to the K-5 space in our district. Until then, we'd only had coding in the upper and high, high school grades. And so I was really excited to see our youngest learners grapple with this very important concept. One of the first things that we bought were these robots. How many of you guys use Wonder Workshop, Stash and Dot? For those of you who don't, uh, you can talk to those who raise their hands and see if you can borrow them. But if not, um, they're robots that allow to make physical and kinesthetic the concepts of code, which is really good for young learners. We started an entire program for our K-5 students where they would come in for a week over breaks, get entrenched deeply in the concept of code, and then continue learning throughout the year. And during winter break one year, we kicked this off with our two through five students. Imagine my excitement when I walked into the room and I saw all these shiny robots, students tinkering away and thinking like, yeah, I wrote that grant, you're welcome, I did that. Until I saw three girls sitting in the corner. And I walked over to them and I saw Katie, Bianca, and Daria, their box unopened, not even looking at their iPads, looking outright bored and despondent. And I said to them, what's wrong? Are, are your 
dash and dot device is not working. Did no one come over to help you? And Bianca gave me this exaggerated sigh and eye roll that only a fourth grader can do. She went, oh, Miss McGarra. I can't code. I'm just a girl. And so I lost my cool. I wanted to go on this whole thing about like, of course she thinks that because the media tells her she can't do things. Whenever you look at coders in mass media and on television, they're all dudes. You know, like Steve Jobs, he's a dude. Sergey Brin, he's a dude. Mr. Robot, he's a dude. Like, where's Mrs. Robot? There's not a lot of women who are showing coding. And I wanted to go on this whole tangent with the three girls and pull them out of coding class and like be like, yeah, we have to smash the patriarchy and like equity for women. And then I had to like stop, take about 100 steps back, slow my roll, and do what any mature district administrator would do in this situation which is look the girls straight in the eye and say, I triple dog dare you to code. <laughs> and the girls were like, excuse me? And I said, I triple dog dare you to code. I believe so deeply that you can code that I will dare you to do it. If you can't code by the end of today, the entire rest of this week of coding camp is do whatever you want day. And they were like, really, we can do whatever we want? And I'm like, yes, you can do whatever you want. They were like, can we run around the halls and paint them brown? I was like, you do whatever you want. They're like, can we eat all of the Hot Pockets in the lunchroom? I'm like, you do whatever you want. And the principal's behind them being like, what are you doing? Do not, you are crazy. And I'm like, it's cool, I got this. I'm a district admin, I know what I'm doing. So this was on Monday. I want you to watch this video that Katie Bianca and Daria made later that week and pay attention to the days of the week and what happened next. Now, did any, I remember, I triple dog dared these young ladies on Monday. What day did they create this code? Thursday. So, so here's what happened. I come back on Tuesday feeling very confident that the girls are going to be master coders and that I clearly won the bet. I walk in and they're sitting in the corner and they're not quite coding, but they're also not quite as pouty as Monday. And I walk over and I said, hey girls, how's it going? Did you learn how to code yesterday? And they're like, well, not really. And I said, oh, no, oh, I guess you guys get to do whatever you want the rest of the week. And they're like, yeah. And I said, what do you want to do? And they were like, code. <laughs> and I said, really? And they said, here's the thing, Miss McGarra. Did you know that coding is like a language? And I said, really? And they said, did you know that with code you can create things? And I said, really? And they said, did you know that we solved a problem using code? And I said, really? You see, Katie, Bianca, and Daria, their favorite thing to do when they weren't in school is dance. And they were part of their grade level's dance group. The problem was, that year, in their grades, um, a terrible bout of whooping cough in, um, was coming out. And a lot of the kids were out absent for the big recital. The fourth girl in their four-girl dance recital, two Adele's rolling in the deep, 
had gotten sick and was home for the week. The result of that was they weren't quite as symmetrical and it really bothered my beautiful OCD darlings. So they coded the robot Dash how to be the fourth girl in their dance routine and brought him up on stage. And in fact, they said he's not a him, he's a her. Got their moms to sew Dash a tiny dance uniform and this was the process that they used to teach Dash the dance. Now, it was amazing to see the girls immediately not only overcome that single story of what girls can and can't do, but also find a really authentic application for it. They became so empowered by that transition of understanding of what they can do and finding that untold story that they wanted to empower other students and other girls from around our district to conquer that single story of girls can't code. So two of the girls decided to create a follow-up video. They very were clearly telling me, Miss McGarrett, this is a viral video. You need to put it on YouTube so it can go viral. And I'm like, OK, um, and created this. Can you tell their dancers? They choreographed their viral video. They were like, and then we're going to go now at the end, like this. Now, Katie, Bianca, and Daria um, had that single story of student self-image. Uh, popular culture, media, people that they had been in contact with had told them that coding was a male discipline, that girls can't code. But they were able to shatter that story and find that untold story of limitless potential. As educators, we need to really be cognizant of the single stories our kids are being exposed to and help them unlock those untold stories. And to tell them, look, if there isn't an untold story where someone who looks like you, who's from where you're from, who has the background that you have, is, not, is doing the thing that you want to do, then you be the first person to tell that story. And you tell it loudly and you tell it proudly. And I think it's an honor that as educators, we have the opportunity to help them shape those paths. The second single story that I want to talk about is that single story of teachers and the untold story of wizards. Now, for me, being an educator has a lot to do with identity. Uh, for example, um, I, I mentioned to some of you this morning who are in my session, my husband, Jim, is an attorney. And if you were to meet Jim uh, in line for coffee somewhere and got to chatting with him, he would chat with you, he's a friendly guy. You would learn a lot about him. You'd learn that he is an avid Chicago Cubs fan. And when they world, won the World Series up to that time, it was the best moment of his life, which hurt my feelings because I got married to him before they won the World Series. And he said, this is the best day of my life. Um, you would find out that he loves craft beer and barbecue. But what you would not find out about Jim is that he's an attorney. And the reason why Jim doesn't really talk about being an attorney is because according to Jim, being a lawyer is just what he does for a job. It's not who he is as a person. So why would he talk about it when he's not at work? He's out of work. I don't want to talk about it. But if you were to get in line with me for coffee, and I bet if I were to get in line with many of you for coffee, you would find out immediately that I'm an educator. And I think that you would probably find out for you too, because I talk about it a lot. And the reason I talk about it a lot is for me, being an educator isn't just what I do, it's who I am. It's about identity. And so for a long time, I would try and think, what does it mean to be a teacher? What does it mean to be an educator? And as a young child, I had a single story of what a teacher was. I had very traditional teachers for most of my young childhood that were, you know, would stay in the front of the room, sit behind their desk, you come pass the paper to me and otherwise sit quietly at your desk and do your work. And that was my experience for my first, you know, three or four years of school. And that was the type of teacher I'd seen on TV. That became my single story of what a teacher was. And if you'd asked me when I was six, seven years old, do you want to be a teacher when you grow up? And I would say, no, it looks terrible. I pictured the mean uh, Mrs. Trunchbull from Matilda every time I pictured teachers. Until I met Miss Buckman. Ms. Buckman was my fourth grade teacher. And the first day of school, I got to the classroom, and I noticed there was no adult in the room. But we were all sitting at our desks, because at my elementary school, Bear Lake Elementary, there was always an adult watching you somewhere. Even if you couldn't see them, they were watching you. It was like the Eye of Sauron from Lord of the Rings. They were just always watching. So we all sat down, because we were like, clearly, this is a test. So we sat quietly at our desks, waiting for the adult to make their appearance. 
All of a sudden, this woman with shock white hair falls into the room, literally falls into the room, and starts knocking over trash cans, looking under papers, rummaging everywhere. And we're all terrified because we're like, clearly, this insane woman broke into our school and is trying to find like her contact lens or something in here. And then she looks at us, and she makes eye contact with us. And we're like, oh god, she can see us. <laughs> and she said, well, what are you going to do? Just sit there staring at me or help me out? We're like, uh, like, what do you say when a crazy person asks you to help them with an unknown task? And she said, I lost my pet Tyrannosaurus Rex Jeff, and I can't find him anywhere. And if we don't find him quickly, we're all sure to peril. We're like, OK, confirm she's nuts. Then one of the kids in my class realized that an adult was giving us permission to throw furniture upside down and run around screaming. So that's what we did. We're like, ah, yeah, where's the dinosaur? Which was weird, because I do remember very clearly we were like looking under desks. But I think <laughs> we all knew that Tyrannosaurus Rex were big. But anyway, then the crazy lady slams her hands down on a table, silencing the whole room, and says, wait. I'm so sorry, I lost my mind. And they're like, yeah, we can tell. She said, I left my pet dinosaur at home gardening, guarding the fountain of youth. You see, I saw the cumulonimbus clouds in the sky, and I thought it was going to rain today, and I wanted to make sure he held an umbrella over the fountain so as not to dilute its power. Good morning, boys and girls. My name is Miss Buckman. I'll be your teacher this year. Welcome to a year of adventures. And we thought, oh my god, this lady is being paid to teach us. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with fourth grade curriculum circa 1990X, uh, what she was doing is foreshadowing what we were going to talk about that day. We were talking about the Spanish conquistadors who were the first Europeans to make landfall in Florida, Pascua Florida, Festival of Flowers. I remember that because my fourth grade teacher made it really exciting for me to hear about the history of Florida. Juan Ponce de Leon was looking for the fountain of youth that he never did find because he's dead now. And it was said to be in Florida. We learned about weather and clouds, and we, yes, we also learned about dinosaurs. And all of these things, Miss Buckman made us feel like we were being let in on this grand adventure every single time she opened a day. I do not know how that woman had so much energy. She told us she was 395 years old, and she stayed so youthful because of the fountain of youth that she had in her yard. But she came in with boundless energy and excitement and a true passion for what we were going to talk about. Real or imagined, she made us believe it. Later that year, I was sitting on the carpet in her library reading a book that she had given me and said that I would really like The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. And this was the beginning of my love of science fiction and fantasy. Going to these amazing far-off worlds were amazing, but I loved the way that people thought in these books. In these books, the main characters truly believed that anything was possible. And I remember, I, tr I remember the feel of the page, the smell of the book, reading these words for the first time. How many of you are familiar with the story of The Hobbit? Yay! Huh? How many of you read the book and not just didn't saw the movie? Yeah. OK, for those of you who don't know, quick summary, no spoilers. In it, there's a really shy hobbit named Bilbo Baggins who doesn't like adventuring. He just wants to stay in his hobbit hole and like shut in and like watch Netflix all day long. He doesn't want to go anywhere. And then there's this like really like uh, rambunctious wizard named Gandalf the Grey. And he wants to go on adventures. And he wants everyone to get out of their houses and just like see the world. And so one day, he goes to Bilbo Baggins' door and ding, 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 knocks on his little round hobbit door and says to him, I'm I'm looking for someone to share an adventure that I'm arranging. Now, this seems like a pretty innocuous sentence, but as I read it, something struck me that was really interesting about this because I thought it was so cool that, number one, someone could just wake up and arrange an adventure. To me, in that point in my nine-year-old life, an adventure was something that happened rarely to special people at very specific times. So for you just to wake up and be like, oh, it seems like a good day for an adventure, I'll just arrange one seemed like a really great idea. And two, I love the idea that you could invite others to your adventure. Like you're just like, I'm arranging a little adventure for three. Would you like to join me? And it, the third thing that occurred to me sitting on that carpet was, oh my god, teachers are wizards. Because my teacher, Mrs. Buckman, 
like Gandalf the Grey, the powerful wizard, spent every single morning inviting us to adventures that she had arranged the night before. On Sunday night, she wasn't lesson planning. She was arranging adventures for us. Every morning, she didn't have do now. She had adventure nows. Every single moment I spent in her class, I felt like she was Gandalf, opening my hobbit door and inviting me on an adventure. In that moment, sitting on the carpet, holding my borrowed copy of The Hobbit, was the moment that I decided the person I want to be when I grow up and for the rest of my life is a wizard. I want to be a teacher like Miss Buckman. So as we think about the single stories of teachers that are told in state houses and legislatures, teachers are lazy, they have the summers off, they're mean, they have one idea, they can't grow. I hear this so much, especially when I was a district administrator working with parents and the board, especially now that I advocate for teachers around the globe. I believe that we as educators can shatter those stories and tell the untold stories of the wizardry that's happening in all of our school buildings, in so many of our classrooms, and help people find all the magic that's happening across education, especially the public education sphere that doesn't get enough credit in any, in any realm. The third story that I want to share with you is the single story of resistant colleagues and the untold story of friendly dragons. Now, when I had that moment of, oh my god, teachers are wizards, again, the catalyst was this quote from The Hobbit. Now, the thing that I didn't share in the last slide, though, was uh, the whole quote. You see, Gandalf says, I'm looking for someone to share an adventure that I'm arranging, but he goes on to say, and it's very hard to find anyone. And Bilbo, like, slammed the door in his face and was like, I don't want to go on an adventure with you. When I left my classroom um, after being a teacher, I, I went into a coaching role, specifically a digital learning coaching role. And I remember being a little bit nervous about moving from a classroom position to an administration position, but I was also nervous about whether I was going to be accepted by my peers. And to my um, surprise, uh, I was not going to be accepted by my peers. You see, I'd worked alongside these teachers for over a decade, and all of a sudden I was in a different spot, and I was peddling in their minds these newfangled ideas and strategies that they weren't so keen on trying. The very first staff meeting that I walked into for a PD around iPads, the most vicious and evil of all technology, I walked in with my cart of iPads. I had everything prepared like a good PD presenter did. I had candy. I had hands-on activities. I had breaks so people could go to the bathroom and complain about me. You know, everything you needed. I walked in and the teachers took one look at me. They didn't know what the item of agenda was. It was, you know, Staff PD Monday. And they saw my card of iPads, saw me, the newly dubbed digital learning coordinator, and literally ran away. And by literally ran away, I mean the room that we were doing PD had a front door and a back door. And they got up and walked out the back door. And I was just standing there with my iPads, all dressed up, nowhere to go. And it hurt, I'll be honest. And I went home and I called my mom. That's what, I was mad. I was like, Mom, the teachers ran away from me. I hate them. And my mother reminded me, because she was a woman of stories, of a story that she used to tell me any time I felt like I wasn't getting my way. Uh, my parents used to have this picture hanging above their bed in my childhood home. And unfortunately, this is the only picture that I have of the picture uh, from when we were packing up the house, but it's right here. And it was a painting of um, a cliff in South Korea called Dragon Rock. It probably has a Korean name, but I don't know it, so we're going to call it Dragon Rock. And the story that my mother would tell me about Dragon Rock um, was, was very important. And just as an aside, if any of you are lucky enough to go to Jeju Island in Korea and see Dragon Rock and read the plaque next to Dragon Rock, you will find that the story I am about to tell you that my dear, beloved mother told me my entire life is 100% made up by her. <laughs> I like to call these things mom facts, when your mom just makes up stories to prove a point to you and acts like they're facts, which they get to do. Now, my mother would tell me this fake story, but meaningful story, of Dragon Rock, and this is how it goes. You see, Dragon Rock uh, is at the bottom of the foothills of a mountain. At the top of the mountain lived a dragon. 
the bottom of the mountain was this very peaceful village and the village was doing okay they weren't in peril or anything but they were just like average you know a solid c plus on uh, the village scale and they knew that they could be get to that higher level of, of enlightenment if they could just get this thing at the top of the mountain and my mother was never clear what that thing was if it was like unlimited wi-fi or like a vat of mashed potatoes but there was something really cool at the top of the mountain that everyone needed the problem was is every time one of the villagers made the trek up the mountain to get this thing the dragon would stop them and eat them it's a problem until one day, a very intrepid uh, villager decided to try it and said, I'm going to be the one. I will do it. So he got his walking stick, and he walked his way up the mountain, and he got to the dragon and got ready to fight him. And as the dragon reared up to roar and gobble him up, he noticed something on his arm. His arm was covered in thorns and brambles from the bushes that are native to the mountain. And he stopped, and he said to the dragon, are you okay? Can I help you? And the dragon stopped mid-roar, mid-bite, because no one had ever asked him that before, and said, well, actually, no. Yeah, I kind of got this thing going on with my arm where it's covered in thorns. And the villager said, and he couldn't really do anything about it because he had big, clunky dragon fingers. So the villager walked up with his nimble digits and plucked them all out and bandaged them up, put some neosporin on it, patched them all got good to go. And the dragon just breathed a sigh of relief. And as the dragon breathed a sigh of relief, all of his scales began to fall away. And as his, all of his scales began to fall away, he slowly melted down into the friendly village elder that had been missing for some odd years. And villager one said, hey, Joe, where have you been all this time? Well, this is a Korean story, so hey, Jaywon, where have you been all this time? And Jaywon says, you know, I actually came up here all those years ago to get, you know, the mashed potatoes at the top of the mountain, but I got stuck in this, this bush, and I got all these thorns, and it, I just, it's so painful, I couldn't pay attention to everything else, and any time anyone else came up the mountain, no one ever stopped to ask me what I needed. They were just so focused on getting to the mashed potatoes that they never would stop to help me. So my mother would always tell me this story when I was like, no one will listen to me, and he's like, she would say, well, are you listening to them? You're trying so hard to get them to do what you want. But have you ever stopped to ask them what they want first? She said, Jennifer, people are so much more likely to hear you and to do what you want if you listen to them first. And so my mother told me this story on the phone, and I huffed and I puffed, and I was like, oh, she's always right. OK, thanks, Mom. Bye. And I went back to PD the next week without my iPads, without devices, and we just sat down and we talked. And I talked to the teachers in the room and I asked them what were the challenges they were facing. And I learned about all of these things that I had never had the time to really realize when I was their colleague. And now that I was in a place to support them, I realized that I had the power to pull some of the thorns out of their arms. And as I helped more and more teachers, I realized that they weren't dragons at all, but they could be wizards as well. Every time I stopped and I listened to one of my colleagues first, I solved a problem for them, even if it wasn't technology related. They then were so much more willing to take a chance with me. And so, the single story of our resistant colleagues being that they're dragons or they're mean or they're doing this to us on purpose, it's really important for us to think of the friendly part of them, to think how can we pull the thorns and unleash their inner wizard, because they're in all of us. But sometimes we're so covered in thorns, we don't have the time to see that inner self. Chapter four is about the single story that we tell the world and the untold story of our inner selves. How many of you are on Facebook? Yeah. For those of you who didn't raise your hands, good choice. Because um, on Facebook, I recently saw this article, Don't Let Facebook Make You Miserable. And I clicked on it because I was like, yes, Facebook does make me miserable. And the reason Facebook makes me miserable is because I have a handful of friends and colleagues, friendish people and family members who are always loving what I like to call hashtag best life ever. Like these people, A, 
I don't know how they live their lives and are always on vacation because they're always on vacation. Every single picture they post, they're at some tropical vacation taking that picture of your feet with sand and an ocean in the background so you can just see how skinny your feet are. And it's like, wow, look at your life. It's so amazing. Here's my cocktail. They're taking selfies at brunch. They're showing their perfectly behaved, incredibly manicured, clean children sitting politely smiling with Santa. Their lives are so perfect, and I hate them. And it makes me feel, what am I doing wrong? What choices have I made that have made my life so awry where I can't have perfect vacation life every single day and always be out at brunch having an all-you-can-eat mimosa special? But thankfully, I read this article by the New York Times reporter, Seth Stevens Stevadovitz. And Seth Stevens Stevadovitz said that our friends especially these best life ever friends, are liars. And he said, not only do I believe they're liars, I know they're liars, and I am a journalist, so I can prove it with data. The math teacher in me said, yes, I will turn to the next page and read this article. I love a good bar graph. He went and he compared social media claims with with on, um, and online uh, trends with actual analytics from different resources. One of the things that he found is that on, uh, on Twitter, people tweet about golf, playing golf, three times more than they do about washing dishes. Surprise! But the average American spends about six times the amount of minutes in a year washing dishes than playing golf. Like, no one's like, oh, just wash that dish. Hashtag best dish ever. Yeah, palm olive rules. It's not happening. Additionally, um, any of you been to Las Vegas? So there's a really beautiful hotel in Las Vegas called the Bellagio. And if you've never been there, it's like the one in Ocean's Eleven and a lot of movies with the pretty fountains that you see. It's a very expensive hotel. And then there's a budget hotel called Circus Circus. Not a bad hotel, but not like a beautiful grand movie hotel. They have the same number of guest rooms in the two hotels. And yet, the number of times people claim to stay at the Bellagio than Circus Circus is four times as many. But, you know, this is an educator conference, so let's talk about some literary habits, shall we? Have you ever heard of the periodical called The Atlantic? If you haven't, it is a, um, it, it has like the articles like the 50 greatest inventions of all time since the wheel. Like it's a very like think and think about uh, magazine and a lot of people like to sound smart by quoting articles from it. But then there is of course the timeless and classic periodical, the National Enquirer, that also publishes hard hitting journalism such as Skynet is a reality, Tony Stark says so, go home and smash your cell phones immediately. Now, can anyone guess how, well, let me just tell you this. The National Enquirer sells three times the number of copies than the Atlantic every year. Can anyone guess how many more times people claim to read the Atlantic on Facebook over the National Enquirer? Just shout out some guesses. Three times, seven, a hundred. It's getting closer, a little over. But uh, 45 more times. I'm going to turn this bar graph sideways so you can see visually. 45 times the number of people, they're like, yeah, I read this article about the greatest inventions of all time. There were 50 of them. No, you didn't. You didn't read it. You were reading the National Enquirer. Or the people who are reading the National Enquirer aren't bragging about it. Now, the thing about all of this is that there is an old maxim that is not Seth Stephen Devadovitz's. It's, it's used across many different self-help groups and um, you know, painted on pictures with cats. Uh, and the idea is that... Um, don't compare your insides to other people's outsides, right? Like, don't compare who you are deep inside to what other people choose to share of themselves. But Seth Stevens Savadovitz goes on to say, of course this advice is difficult to follow. We never see other people's insides. So yeah, I don't want to compare what you choose to share, your curated life, with who I truly am, but how do I know that I'm not just, like, utterly failing when all I ever see is everyone's shiniest, best Facebook selves? And so Seth Steven Devadovitz decided to figure out how do we find out what's on people's insides, so we decided to use public Google Analytics. 
Um, on Facebook, it seems like the things, he did a poll and he found that people seem to think that according to Facebook, their friends were always on vacation, having brunch, taking selfies, and living hashtag best life ever. I um, kind of truncated what he really said to that last line because that's essentially what he was saying. But at the time of this article in 2017, if you looked up the most searched terms for I always, the four top search results in the United States were I always feel tired, have to pee, have diarrhea, and am bloated. <laughs> Notice column A and column B do not align. Now, they're not mutually exclusive. Someone can always be on vacation and always have diarrhea if they're not safe and careful as they travel. But the point is, is that they're not posting about the second thing. Some people might. So I decided to ask myself, am I a Facebook liar? Like, I was so mad at all the people on Facebook who seemed to be living hashtag best life ever. And then all of a sudden, I looked in the mirror and I said, oh my god, maybe I'm doing it too. So I looked at my own Facebook. And it's like, hi, guys. Here I am in Iceland in a geothermic pool, hashtag best life ever. Oh my god, here I am indoor skydiving with my friends, hashtag best life ever. Hanging out with my husband by the pool, hashtag best life ever. Oh my god, I'm a Facebook liar. So I decided that my mid-year resolution that year was going to be the next time that I was facing a challenge, I was going to show my inside on social media so that I could be a little bit more honest with my public self. And it just so happens that I had a chance right away. You see, my husband and I have been having a problem. Not a marital problem. We're good. I like the Cubs too now. It's cool. But at that point, for six years, we've been trying to have a family, a larger family than just the two of us and our wonderful Schnauzer Pepper. And for six years, it wasn't working. Sometimes it would work, and then after a few months, it would stop working. And it was really hard. Um, and the thing about when you are trying to do something that you care desperately about and failing over and over again is that all of a sudden it becomes apparent that everyone around you is very easily successful at that same thing. And that sucks. And so we spent six years trying and trying and watching all of our friends become successful again and again and again. Every time I was on Facebook, it was like my friend Priya sneezed and had 14 more children. <laughs> and I, I got sad and angry and, and really hard on myself. And I thought to myself, maybe I'm just never going to have kids. Maybe I'm not the type of person who can have kids. I'm just bad at this. So one day, my husband and I were trying to make a really important decision about taking the next step um, in our, our life uh, to see if we wanted to take more invasive steps to have a family, and I was scared. I was scared because I didn't know anyone else who had done it before. I didn't know anyone to talk to, and I wanted to know, is this safe? Is it successful? Is it worth the money, the time, the emotion? And I said to Jim, I have to know at least one person who went through this who isn't telling me. Would you mind if I posted this on Facebook? And my husband was like, I don't care. I don't even use Facebook. Do whatever you want. So I posted this on Facebook. And I wrote this out, exactly what had been going on, how long it had been going on. And you know, I essentially wrote a Facebook essay, which I'm not normally prone to do, but this was very hard. And the moment I hit post, I immediately regretted it. Thought, what will people think? What will people say? And I wanted to go back and delete it, but by the time I went back to delete it and rethought it, over 288 people had liked it, and I had over 75 comments. And every single comment was a comment of support and love. And not only that, but the thing that was so incredibly amazing to me was that so many people in my life who I thought were so easily having children had gone through or were going through the exact same struggle that I was facing secretly. In fact, my friend, who had 14 kids, was like, I had the same issue. My husband and I spent so long trying to have so-and-so, and then so long trying to have so-and-so, and then it just started happening, and we couldn't stop it. In fact, we don't even like these three, so if you want any of them, 
We will donate them to the cause. I had people knocking on my door, reaching out to me, asking what they could do to support me. And when you feel like you are the only person in the entire world who is having a challenge, only to realize that the loved ones around you not only are there to support you, but have been in your shoes before, and the success that you are witnessing and so deeply envious of came at the same pain and struggle that you're currently facing, it tells you, I can do this too. I'm not abnormal for having challenges. I'm not abnormal for failing. I can persevere. If they can do it, so can I. So my husband took the next step, and it resulted in these two embryos. And then we took the next step, and it resulted in this cute little peace sign baby. <laughs> and we took the next step, and it resulted in my daughter, Lucy. Now, I love being a new mom. I have thought of so many untrue mom facts to tell Lucy. I really love spending time with her. I love posting pictures of myself mocking her on social media. And it's been really hard, I'll be honest. This is my first trip away from her. She's going to be three months tomorrow. And I almost called Cynthia and was like, I'm not coming. It's really hard being away, and for all of you who have parents or loved ones at home when you have to work, it's hard being away. And so, you know, last night I was FaceTiming with her, and I'm learning, too, that as a mom, you know, my identity is now educator and mom. And I'm learning that I need to continue telling the whole story, the untold story. So I can't just post it like, did a keynote at CMTC, hashtag best life ever. I need to also post about how I was sobbing in a nursing pod at Newark Airport during my three-hour flight delay, trying desperately to make milk for my baby and arguing with TSA about why I could bring liquids through, because they were like, my children's life and this is gold and I will kill you if you take this from me. I don't care if I go to jail as long as the milk survives. Also, fun fact for moms uh, who did not have access to this, airports have nursing pods now. Isn't that cool? Including Manchester Airport, which I am going to run to after this keynote. <laughs> now, as I started to think about untold stories and the fact that there are these curated versions of ourselves on social media and these inner selves, you know, obviously I was thinking, how does this apply to my work as an educator and as an administrator? And I realized that there are so many untold stories on the road to innovation. For example, in my classroom, I used to do this thing called cloning the teacher. What I would do is when I wanted to differentiate and there was only one of me, and at one point I had 41 fourth and fifth graders in a grade four or five split. Yes, I said 41. Gulp. How do I differentiate for them in a 50 minute math block? And even if I only had 10 kids, how do you differentiate with one of you and 10 of them? So I create these little videos, these mini lessons where kids could have their differentiated playlists of learning that Saul Khan didn't create, I created. And I think that I'm a better teacher than Saul Khan. I mean, I'm not saying I'm a better teacher, but I think all of us are a better teacher than Saul Khan, just saying. Anyway, um, I would like to see his teacher degree. Sorry, that's a different keynote. So I would create these videos on things like the volume of the pyramid and my students would uh, thereby listen to them and learn and get differentiation. And I started talking about it at different conferences and PDs across Chicagoland. And I became known as Math Jenny. And everyone called me Math Jenny because I wouldn't shut up about math and my name is Jenny. And I would talk about these things and be like, oh, but Jenny, it's so easy for you. Like, this is what you do. You love math. You love technology. You probably just wake out up and just like, you know, sneeze and boom, 15 math videos come out. And the reason that why people thought that is because I was telling the single curated story of my work. I'd get up on stages like this and I'd be like, and then bada bing, bada boom, differentiation, ta-da! <laughs> and I would never tell about the troubles that I got along that road. For example, I never taught about the time that I first did this in my classroom. I came in over the weekend and I created all the videos and I synced them to all of my students' iPads. I did spend a lot of time doing it. When I got in, all the kids turned on their iPads, put on their headphones, and I said, truly, I am a wizard, for I have made 41 9 and 10 year olds silent for three minutes. But then I heard one kid laugh, then I heard another kid laugh, 
Then the whole room starts erupting in laughter, and I think, that's weird. Volume of pyramids is not usually such a funny topic. What is going on? So I go over to one of their iPads and realize, to my utter horror, I had not synced my incredibly thoughtful series of videos on volume, but instead, the 2010 raunchy comedy rated R hit Hot Tub Time Machine <laughs> to 41 fourth and fifth graders' iPads. And they had been watching it for three minutes. So I thought to myself, well, it was really cool being a teacher for a little while. <laughs> and then I had a really interesting conversation with my class. Then I had 41 really interesting conversations with parents. And then I had a really scary conversation with my principal. But here's the thing. I survived to tell the tale. I survived to try it again the next day and to learn, A, I need to get better taste in movies than I'm renting over the weekend. And B, maybe use a different way to sync videos than your personal laptop. I had so many bumps at the road that were like this, and some of them were maybe worse. But I survived to tell the story, and what I realized as someone who is supporting teachers is I needed to tell this story just as often as I told the story about how to differentiate using videos. Because if we're only having that single story that we tell the world, the inner selves can never come out. And if we're not sharing that inner selves, we're creating impossible bars for others to follow. Now, chapter five is about how technology can help us shatter this single story. There's all these untold stories that we could tell, but it's really hard to spread stories one at a time. As a technology administrator, a lot of people would ask me, you know, what do you want technology to do? And obviously, I want technology to enhance our connection to the world, to resources, to apps, to learning materials. But ultimately, I want technology to enhance our connection to each other. And the way that we can really do this is to think about how we're telling these untold stories. Without technology, if I wanted to tell you a story, you had to be physically there with me. For example, if all of you guys woke up this morning and said, eh, I'd rather stay in today, I'm going to call in sick, and none of y'all showed up, I'd just be a crazy lady standing here talking to an empty room. No one would hear these stories. But through social media, even if you guys all called in sick, I could still reach you from your beds or couches uh, by using things like Twitter or YouTube or Snapchat. I guess that's Snapchat. That's YouTube. There we go. And my students really soon uh, became aware of this. And my students from the south side of Chicago had a lot of untold stories they wanted to tell. For example, one of our um, years, they wanted to bring coding more pervasively throughout the building. And the principal didn't think that we had the money and support from the PTO, from the school board, from et cetera, to fund a technology teacher. And so the kids wanted to tell their story through, yes, you guessed it, a viral video. They took to social media to tell the story of why they wanted technology. created a series of videos like this to inspire their principal to believe in coding, which worked. And this, uh, that happened about six years ago. And to this day, that building has coding education for every student K through eight as a result of them sharing their stories throughout the community and convincing them to crowdsource uh, funds to start the first technology teacher. Um, it also helped the students to apply for grants to upgrade our Wi-Fi system in that building and help the students create their own student-founded community support groups and uh, clubs to give back to their communities. 
These are just a few examples of how untold stories have created real and, um, and tangible impact in their communities. And it's just from amplifying these stories that a lot of people aren't hearing. And not only is it allowing them to create change in their communities, but it's also creating change in them. Uh, I, I do this thing with my students where as they're graduating every year, we would always do this like post-user survey for the past X years they were in our buildings to say, how did it go? What can we do better? Uh, always learning, always iterating. And when I recently did this with the same group of kids a few years after they created these videos, here's what they had to say for what was the one best thing that we did for you in your time at the school. Oops. I love what Taylor says there, that it remembers who we are and that we can be someone inside of school and outside of school, that you matter at all times of your day. You know, we hear Angela Meyer say the you matter concept, and it's one thing to tell kids their matter and another thing to make them truly believe it and feel it. And allowing them these platforms to tell their untold stories is a really great way to do so. So one of the untold stories that uh, the students in our area created uh, that I love to tell the story time and time again is this isn't Chirac. And this was an untold story for a long time, but now it's being told a lot. And the thing about untold stories is not just that they're never told, but an untold story can be a story that's not told enough. And so this isn't Chirac is uh, from my former student teacher, uh, Miss Rose, Lindsay Rose. And after she was my student teacher, she went to go teach in a neighborhood on the South Shore neighborhood of Chicago. For those of you who aren't familiar with South Shore, if you were to Google it, you would hear not about the great things about the neighborhood, which is that they have this beautiful historic cultural center, um, a golf course in the city of Chicago, the stables where the Chicago Police Department used to house their horses. But instead, articles like this about gang violence, gun shootings, and in fact, so much so that the local media has dubbed that neighborhood Terror Town. And it's really bothered Lindsay's students. This was truly a single story that was being told about their neighborhood, and they hated it. They hated seeing the community that they, that they loved and lived in be characterized in this singular and negative way. So they used social media to tell their untold story. They created YouTube videos, they wrote letters, they tweeted, and they read a book by Sandra Cisneros, A House on Mango Street. Anyone familiar with that? And they used that amazing book, I see a lot of people nodding and smiling, as a mentor text to find language to tell a counter narrative, to tell the untold story about their neighborhood. Their story went viral. Truly, no tongue in cheek, it truly went viral. Every large media outlet in Chicagoland covered their story. The Chicago Sun Times, the Tribune, the local NPR stations, they all covered it. In fact, they sent a news crew down to have the students tell their story professionally to a camera, and the community was amazed. They commented that it was the first time in their entire lifetime they saw the news come to their community to tell a story of positivity, all thanks to their kids uncovering this untold story. We cited the cameras here, and we read the article, Six Shots, that was the one man, another man, shooting the chair down. We saw the news reporter.
given a chance by the teacher to share their untold story. Technology helped to shatter it by making sure that untold story was told again and again and again. This video is on YouTube now and has seen, been seen on every continent, including Antarctica, because they were able to find a National Geographic crew to watch it with the penguins. The thing about untold stories is when we empower our kids to tell them, we also want to make sure we get it in front of audiences so that the kids can feel heard. We also need to do that for ourselves. Untold stories can be incredibly powerful if we use them to help reshape the narrative. And we can all do that as educators. So my final epilogue for you is about a blue bird. When I graduated from college, I told you, when, from the moment I was in fifth grade on Miss Buckman's carpet, I knew I wanted to be a teacher, and I had that singular vision. And so I went to school, got my degree, graduated, and I got a job on the south side of Chicago teaching fourth grade just like my life idol, Mrs. Buckman. So I contacted her at Bear Lake Elementary, where she was still teaching because she uh, was, you know, 150 billion years old at this point. I don't know what she was telling her kids. Um, and she had that beautiful fountain of youth. And I said to her, I'd love to have lunch with you. I'm going to come down to Orlando, and I'd love to talk to you. I have some great news. She said, OK. I wasn't sure if she'd remember me, but she said, OK. And she met me, and we sat down, and she smiled at me, and she said, so I hear you're going to be a teacher. And I thought, oh my god, this woman is truly a wizard. How did she know that? Um, and she reaches into her purse, this Mary Poppins purse that she had all these things in, and she pulls out a vial of water which she would always show us was her water from the Fountain of Youth, and she'd always drink out of it. And thinking, oh, she's going to you know, say that she is a magician, and this is her magic water. And then she pulls out some other things. And then at the bottom of her bag, she has this Ziploc bag full of papers, old yellowing papers, some new, some old. And I look over, and I look at it, and I recognize my mother's handwriting. And I realize that for all these years, throughout my entire life, these two women that made such an impression on me, my mother and Mrs. Buckman, had been writing letters about me back and forth behind my back and was incredibly disturbed. <laughs> no, I was, I was honored. And I thought, you know, this is amazing. You know, my mom, Ms. Buckman, they're besties. This is going to make this even more impactful. And I said, yes, I am going to be a fourth grade teacher. I'm going to be just like you. I'm so excited. I mean, I, I've been thinking about how I'm going to start the first day. And, you know, in Illinois, we don't really learn about the fountain of youth, but we talk about, you know, different type of explorers. So I thought I'd come in and put stuff around the room for them to find. And I'm going to make it an adventure. And I'm going to do my hair crazy so they think I'm a little crazy. And I'm really excited. I want to be just like you, Mrs. Buckman. I can't wait. And she took both of my hands in her hands. And she looked me right in the eye and she said, oh, sweetheart, you can't be just like me. And I thought, oh my god, how arrogant can I possibly be? Of course, I couldn't, like, you have been teaching for literally ever. Like, I, I'm a first year teacher, I apologize. Like, I, I hope to someday be just like you and I'm going to try my best. And she said, no, 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 Jenny, you, you misunderstand. You can't be just like me, because if you're like me, who will be you? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, Jenny, the teacher your students deserve isn't you trying to be me. It's you being yourself. It's you being the best version of you that can possibly be. The thing about role models is we shouldn't aspire to be like our role models. We should aspire to eclipse them and be better than them. 
She said, I know that you can be a better teacher than I was. I believe it. And I have something for you if you promise me something. And she reached into that endless bag of tricks and she pulled out this glass blue bird that I meant to pack with me and then forgot when I was packing my, my milk pump instead. <laughs> and this glass blue bird was on her desk every day that I knew her throughout all the years that I went back to visit her. And she called it the glass blue bird of happiness. She would talk to it when she was mad at us. She would say, blue bird of happiness, please help me so I do not murder these children. She would have a little joke with it, but we always knew this was a main character in her classroom, and she was offering to give it to me, and I would do literally anything to have this bird. So I said, yes, Miss Buckman, I will do whatever you want. Just give me this bird. And she said, Jenny, I will give you this bird if you promise me that this is the only part of me that you bring into the classroom. You can use it to remember me. You can use it to be inspired by me. But everything else you do, make sure it's truly you, because that that is the magic to how to be an amazing teacher. Be yourself. Don't try and be like someone else. Don't try and copy a keynote that you saw or a session. Take ideas from it, remix it, and make it your own recipe. And so, as you guys are leaving this event and going back to your schools as building leaders, as educators, as advocates and stakeholders, I ask you to think about the untold stories in your communities whether it be about a little girl named Kyungshin, or who's currently being called Kello, or whether she's found herself as Katie. Even more, find the untold stories about yourself and your colleagues and your schools and your communities. I ask you, as educators with voices, as people leading school change, find these untold stories. Tell these untold stories, and please set them free. Thank you.